Hello and welcome back once again to Swiping Through History. We are here today with Mike Ingram to discuss in more detail episode four, the Battle of Northampton. Hi Mike, thank you for being with us. Hello again. It's so lovely, we're doing this so often now. I feel like this is uh, becoming part of the routine, it's lovely. <laughs> um, so to start with, obviously the Battle of Northampton is a very, very complicated, uh, intricate um, battle to explore. There's a lot of different details that come in and build up over the, 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 the years leading up to it. So obviously in the, in the documentary, when we keep it to the, 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 the 12 minutes that it is, there's a few things we don't cover in as much detail as they really deserve. So that's our opportunity to, to discuss today. You know, this is our opportunity to go into that little bit more detail. Um, so first and foremost, um, the Lancastrians, why did they decide to build an encampment and, you know, decide to fight from that perspective instead of just an open battle? Um, it, it's quite a difficult answer uh, because, to be honest, we don't know for 100% why mm. they did it. It does seem at this time warfare was generally going in this direction towards fortified encampments. Uh, right. we, we get hints of it at Ludford, uh, as we, we spoke about before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's also very much uh, the last battle of the Hundred Years' War, the Battle of Castellon. Uh, the French had actually built a fortified encampment, filled it with cannons uh, and guns, and drew the English across the front and completely destroyed the um, the, the English army. Ouch! So, so, so there's a, a strong possibility that they were trying to emulate what the success had been done at Castellon. It's funny how we don't, as the English, we don't tend to remember that battle, is it? We remember the Ashen <laughs> Cores, the Cressies, but the Castellon, no, we, 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 we tend to, you know, let that one go by. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So the, the camp set up in a meadow, um, very probably for that reason, um, that they can do the same thing. And the Earl of Shrewsbury, who was killed at the Battle of Castellon, his son was at the Battle of Northampton. Oh, and right. his son his son might have been um at Castellon as well. You might have been one of the few survivors. And was he a Lancastrian? He was a Lancastrian, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. So he, he was in the side of the defences. So effectively we're copying the strategy of the French. Yes. Yeah. Um, Only we don't do it as well. <laughs> well, no, because if it if it worked, it was it was the perfect defence, but the Lancastrians had everything going against them basically. Uh, and it just didn't work on the day. Which I think brings us to the next question, really, which is uh, the role of the cannons in Northampton. I, I brush upon this in the video that, you know, it's the first use of mass cannons in, in England. Um, yes. So I believe that plays an important part in why the camp isn't as effective as it should have been. No, the, the, the cannons don't work. Ah. Um, we don't know why we don't as always with all these stories there are lots of big holes and gaps in the in the history um we know they don't fire wavering in his account talks about them making lots of smoke um it, it's like like a cartoon lots of smoke a big bang but the cannonball just rolls out the end of the barrel and falls on the floor in front of it and um uh, and so so we know they don't work um, there is another account that talks about, there's a chap named John Judd, who is the, the master gunner of the Lancastrians. Right. And he, he was murdered at St Albans two weeks before the battle by Yorkists. Oh, wow. Uh, apparently he was on his way up to Coventry with more guns, uh, with, with more cannons. Now... And uh, was that like was, an assassination attempt? It or, or? sounds like it. Again the sources are a bit vague and exactly all the detail and, and what happened. Um, but if they hadn't, um, gunpowder at the time was not a compound like it, it sort of is today. It was a pure mixture and you had the various component parts uh, of certain quantities and, and certain weights. Mm. So it all works together. Now, if you don't get those mixtures right, it would ha have the exact effect 
of what um, of what Wavrin talks about of the bang, the smoke, but no fire. Okay. So I think more likely that's what had happened, and the Lancastrians hadn't got somebody who could mix the gunpowder right. Sweet. So so effectively, what you are saying is that because the Yorkists assassinated this Lancastrian gunner, a head gunner, as we'll call yep. it, the, the Lancastrians, they, they may not have had the expertise on their side to ensure that the cannons were effective on the battlefield and they needed them. Exactly. Okay. So, yeah, so it, it, it's all that kind of, as we, as we mentioned before, it's that level of detail which it becomes so intricate. It, it's such a rabbit hole that you go down it and it links to all these different theories and things and, and just how the story has been told over the years. And it's, you know, it's, it's thanks to your research, and uh, I have it here this time ready, and the wonderful <laughs> book you've written about the battle, which kind of allows us to explore who these people were. That then moves us on to, um, which I think is an important question as well, uh, is an excommunication. You know, from, from, your, from, your, from your perspective, uh, what is that and why is it so crucial? I mean, I just have this image in my mind of this guy standing at the top of the hill. The Lancastrians can't hear him because he is quite a way away and he's just, you know, waving his hands around in some kind of like, you know, ritual fashion. But it, it has the impact of changing the entire battle. Yeah, um, Capini being a, a papal legate and according to the accounts, uh, he, do, he does the whole thing of an excommunication and it's not a... Um, a low-level excommunication. It's the highest form of excommunication you can get. And you have um, the Bible, he has a, um, a candle, there are probably people ringing bells, so they would have oh, really wow. listened to him. Uh, it, it's, it's very theatrical. It's a live piece uh, of performance then. Yeah, yeah, and, and he's doing that, and they might not have all been able to hear him, but they would have known what it was all about. Uh, and would have seen seen the effect of, of, of what it would have been. It's that uh, moment in the course. films, isn't it, where the clouds start coming over and the rain, thunder starts like crackling in the distance and the rain exactly. starts falling. Exactly. Uh, so in and, terms and, of the, um, the international picture, because obviously he's been sent by the Pope, so why is it that the Pope is actually on the side of the Yorkists who are not the anointed king? Right, well, again, because it's never easy, is it? Um, <laughs> well, no. Um, right, you, you're going to have another complicated answer, which I, which I think I can, I can simplify. Um, first of all, you've got the Dauphin of France, um, who is Louis, mm -hmm. um, and he eventually be, becomes the king, but at this time he's still the, the Dauphin. He hates his father with a passion. Right. Um, because of how... Uh, his father had let the English overtake France, pretty much. Uh, and his father hates him and has been trying to arrest him. And he's been hiding in Burgundy for most of this time. He does, he does anything to annoy his father. So he's supporting the Yorkists. Right. So that's point one. And, and actually, when you go to Telton, uh, he even sends over some banners over to, to Towton to fight on their side. Also, as part of this story, the French are threatening to invade Italy. And they would invade Italy from the top, um, com coming down the top way. And um, because of this, um, Capini is also the, um, is the Bishop of Milan. And Milan's going to be the first city-state that they come to the first to be hit yes so um it seems to have happened and whether the pope was on side he sort of complained um says in his accounts that he didn't know anything about this but i think he probably was quite com complicit in all of this um is that what happens is that um capini he goes over he's um, attaches himself to warwick uh with the idea being that in the current regime or the regime that's in England at the time with obviously Henry on the throne and Margaret of Anjou a French lady being the Queen England will not invade France 
of the right. nation. It's starting to make sense, isn't it? Really, yes. it, it's 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 you, you. It's the end of the Hundred Years' War. The the English king is well still in that in and out of that mental health issues has been yeah. has been weak throughout the last few years you know and and margaret has very much come to the fore as we've talked about before and this yeah. is where her being french becomes an issue for not just the people in england the english who don't like the fact there's a french queen sitting on the throne but also suddenly the the italian city states of milan and and all of those places going hold on a second, now it's kind of, it takes that pressure off France from the yes. north and allows them to put their attention on the Italian city-states. Yeah, so if the um, the English people themselves were still smarting from the defeat at Castellon and they wanted to invade France again, mm. but of course they couldn't or they wouldn't while Margaret was in charge of things. Yeah. So the idea being was that if the... Um, the Duke of Milan sent over Capini and supported the Yorkists. Then, if the Yorkists won, which was which was what the plan was, um, England would then invade France, and then that would very much annoy the French king, um, and it would also change the status quo and would protect Milan at the same time. Right. Hopefully, that explains it. So there is always a political motive behind those religious decisions as well. It's yes. not a purely spiritual thing. No, no, it's, no. It's, all, it's, it's all politics. Was then Margaret actually at the Battle of Northampton or not? Because she plays an important part in what happens next because she, she, she escapes after the battle and heads north to Scotland. But was she likely to have been there with the king in his back pocket or was she just somewhere else? The account suggests that she was watching the battle from the town. The from accounts the town. That, actu that actually mention it, because she would have seen the battle from the walls of Northampton. But Northampton has been burnt by this point, or partially burnt. So but the walls, are, the walls would still be there. She so could stand she, on the walls. Would she, would she have been in the town when they stormed in and they just didn't catch her? or Quite probably, yes. Or is yeah. it just one of those things where they stormed the town, but actually they stormed part of the town, burnt a little it, bit, it's, and then it's realized... part of the town. Yeah. So effectively, they've got the they then had to fight. Yeah, they, they then had to go, okay, hold on a second. We're having a bit of fun here, but we need to get back to the battle. They kind of do yeah. it as making a statement with it. It's not and, a... and if she was in the castle, the castle was still a strong castle at that point. So ah. she could have held out in the castle for a long while, if, if necessary. And what we what we've got to back this up, the now uh, several accounts talk about Margaret being robbed after the battle, but oh, they right. but they t uh, of all her jewels and everything else. Um, there are various people who are blamed for it uh, as taking part in, including one of the Stanleys actually at one part, but we know it wasn't him because he was down in London at the time. Um, because don't forget, while we've got all this backdrop, all this going on at Northampton. Um, the Lancastrians in London have locked themselves up in the Tower of London. Um, they're, and, they're under siege in their own city. Yes, yeah, and the people of Northampton, people of London, led by Salisbury, um, he stays down in London, uh, and William Stanley, among others, uh, are laying siege to, to the Tower of London while all this is going on. Uh, the Lancastrians really annoy the people of London at, during this point because they um, start firing the, the medieval equivalent of napalm out, out into London from the tower and set fire to parts of London. Mm. So that upsets the Londoners and puts them more anti-Lancastrian, which then, when you start to talk about the after, after effects of the Second Battle of St Albans, of why the Londoners resist Margaret at that point, you have to bring this into account at the same time. This is this is an example where um, you know we're covering every single battle of the Wars of the Roses in terms of the you know battles, open field battles. But this is another. This is an example of the Tower of London here of of how actually there's 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 so many little skirmishes and sieges and things that take place throughout this period around the country that obviously we can't tackle every single one of them. No. So. Okay, so so Margaret is 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 watching from the from Northampton. She yeah. escapes and she heads up 
north to Scotland without her jewels. Um, yeah. Now, so, we, we've also got a, um, an account um, of actually of the. It actually it doesn't mention Margaret, but it says all the king jewels are stolen at a village called Gayton, which is just outside Northampton, and it is on the route from Northampton to Watling Street to yeah. the A45 uh, and going out that way, which will then is the route to Wales. So that's the that's very much the evidence of why Margaret was there. Because she that's the route she would have had to have taken to escape. Yeah. And and the fact that it says that the king's jewels were stolen, the separate reports about all Margaret's jewels are stolen. It's just joining the, the two accounts together. It's pieces of the puzzle, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So so that then leads us on to realistically the, the, the last question I want to talk about, which is um, what happens in the uh, immediate aftermath of the battle? So we've got the massacre that's going on. And uh, yeah, Henry the seventh, uh, Henry the sixth. Sorry, he gets captured. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. Um, whether captured's the right word, he falls under Yorkist control. I think is the best way to describe it. So he, the he's under Yorkist control. The same as the first control. battle of St Albans, then. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it's a replay of his, of it all. Um, so you've got that going on. He's kept in Northampton, or he stays in Northampton for a few days. He's then led back to London in a procession led by Warwick the Kingmaker, um, where he then goes and stays at London. Now, the next phase, um, that this is where things, you would think by then it would have been easy. The war was over, Yorkist in control, but then the Yorkists then go and mess it up because what happens is there is a, a, a council meeting uh richard of york comes back from ireland and he goes into that council meeting and he puts his hand on the throne right so that's a, that's a mistake you think that's it that's yeah a big... because what he's doing is effectively saying i am going to be king and in the end what happens is uh on the 25th of october so it's quite a while after the battle yeah um it's agreed on what they call an act, the Act of Accord. Uh, and as part of the Act of Accord, basically says, as long as Henry's alive, he will be king. But once he dies, the Yorkists will then, uh, and their heirs, will then become the kings. Right, yeah. So it, it's a compromise. Um, it also gives a bit of protection to um, Richard of York, because by doing that, that it's then high treason to attempt to kill Richard of York. Because he's now the heir to the throne. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mike. I think that was great. We got a lot of information there. It's probably a little bit longer, this video, than normal. But, you know, as we talk in more and more detail, I think it, it really starts to paint the picture politically around these battles, um, which I think is really useful. And I think for those of you watching, you'll really start to get a sense of how we move from one battle to the next. Um, so thank you once again, Mike, for being with us. It's been great. My to pleasure as always. Oh, awesome, mate. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at Wakefield. Yes. Yeah, we'll be back again. Thank you. To the north. <laughs>